So, sir, firstly, thank you so much, so much for uh, you know taking your time out and doing this podcast with us. No, Me, it's always I, a yeah. pleasure to share, you know, experiences, and you learn while uh, narrating your own experience. You also keep on learning something new about yourself and about things that uh, did go well, did not go well as well. Uh, good way to really look at it. No, sir, that's very kind of you. I'll tell you why we do podcasts. So although the yeah. Yan Bazaar is a managed marketplace for Yan, but sure. we've always believed that uh, a you know there's a lot of information gap in the market. So the Correct. idea is to get experts like you who can share insights and your uh, success story to kind of inspire yes. a larger target textile audience. Sure. Sure. As also textiles overall as an industry kind of lack role models, right? And the more Absolutely. role models, the more we are able to attract the younger generation. Correct. Correct. Sure, One sure. One thing I loved about your bio in LinkedIn is that you, you, you know, you made a great statement where you said your aim is to bring uh, romance back to retail. Correct. That was Correct. very fascinating to me. So I want to start with that. Uh, you know, sure. sure. Why retail? Why such a you know big passion on retail and you know bringing romance back to retail? Of course, we understand that you know the e-commerce evolution has happened, and you know, yes, maybe positively or negatively, but it has definitely impacted retail. I you know would love to hear your thoughts on this statement. So retail, finally, actually, it's you know uh, my journey. So I started with product because I love textile, I love fabric. That's how I joined B Text, and then uh, ended up joining Mafatlal first, and then took my journey towards apparel through Arrow, which was my first apparel brand that I really had it. And from apparel, when I moved on to Stan Rose and then to Bombay Dye, I also touched upon retail because Arrow also we launched uh, exclusive stores as well. Uh, but the real taste of retail came in when I joined Shoppers in 2001 because that's where pure retail is all about. Because earlier I was to do franchise stores, few company-owned stores, but Shoppers is all about running your own stores and large stores at that scale. And when I joined, it was just about six stores. When I stepped down, we had just about 250 plus stores across multiple formats, multiple categories, etc. And uh, retail, the best thing about it is it's a very great combination of three things that are most ideal in any business. One is consumer. Second is product. And third is your own team members, which is people. So people, whether it's consumers or your team members are very common. And that's the biggest component. And third, obviously, is the product, which is your merchandise, assortment, etc., etc. To top it up, you have multiple things, you know, like location of the store, the design of the store, the services that you offer, the loyalty program. So that's why I call retail is a lot of people call it as art. Some people call it as science. But I call it as art, science, and maths because there is a lot of maths behind running a successful chain. There's a lot of art in creating the brand, creating advertising, designing the stores, visually merchandising them. And then there is obviously science, which really means what assortment to really pick up, how to design the store, what is the kind of fixture you require, what is the and of stocking you require, what's the replenishment frequency required. So it's basically a combination of art, science, and maths. And a lot of people confuse it that they think it is only art, they think it is only science. And some people completely forget that there's maths involved in a retail store. And that's why when I evolved over a period of time, when I joined shoppers, I didn't know so much about retail. And over a period of time, I think I I learned a lot. I'm still learning a lot. Uh, but as I mentioned, one of the big, biggest worst enemy of retail is a lot of people think that they arrived, they are successful, and they stopped moving up. And as you know, like just like life, change is constant. In retail, change is constant. Consumers change, products change, brands change, environment changes, technology changes. Then online also came in, for example. So a lot of people stick to what they have and just copy-paste that formula from one store to the other, which is why I say this copy-pasting is really dangerous. And that's why you require every new store is romance. Every new store is like a new marriage in the family. Every new store, you are inviting new families into your store. And that's why it is all about romance. And it's like movies, you know, every Friday a movie releases, whether it is a Jawan or a Pathan or a Ghadar or anything that you have it, you really don't know whether it's going to be a hit or a failure. But you work maybe two years in for a movie, maybe it's two years to three years to really create a movie and deliver it on a Friday. 
these days thursday but you really don't know whether it's going to be hit or not so that for that friday same thing happens for the store opening you work almost for a year right from signing of a property to designing it and then putting the merchandise there selecting your team members getting them there training them and then launch the store some stores work some stores don't work but why some stores work why don't they don't work in other locations i think you have to keep on finding answers to that and that's where the science of understanding is important and you have to go back and understand how to make the maths work and to make the maths work again you have to use art and that's what this whole thing about retail is it's a combination of art science and maths and that's why it's romance you know you have to have passion in what you do you have to create that trust in whatever you do and i think one of the big things for me is passion about people and consumers and product that's what really keeps you alive all the time and that's why i call it romance nice i think that that's very well said so uh, are you a shahrukh khan fan uh i not really but uh, i would say i i like him uh, i'm not his fan i would say but i, I know because you like mentioned jawan and pathan in the same statement so that maybe yeah yeah but that's... i've seen him in close quarters because you know we tied up with uh, farah khan and sharuk for om shanti om and uh, okay. we i did observe him very closely and he was our brand ambassador when we cho- changed our logo i think he is one of the smartest man in the not only in the retail in the movie industry but in india i would say he is one of the brainiest guy and uh, without doubt and the way he carries himself most of the time is really phenomenal the way he interacts etc and uh, the way he respects women i think that's one of his biggest characteristics and i would say positives about him why movies are such a big hit for him is the way he carries himself through and through and the characters that he portrays so some of the movies like swadesh chak they are phenomenal in my opinion although they they did not make so much money like a jawan or a pathan but that's that's not important i think he tried to really change himself a lot and he is he is one of the guys who you know who has traversed from a villain to a hero very very successfully not many uh, actors or heroes have been able to do it i would say only amitabh bachchan is ahead of him in trying to reinvent himself so sharuk is one guy who has reinvented himself time and again and he is also a great businessman by the way so if you look at the way he has managed kkr and other franchises etc great great guy and uh, definitely i respect him a lot for what he has done uh, in the movies uh, for sure right so since you spoke so much about retail i just want to add my two cents there sure uh, you know when we look at e-commerce today i think yeah. what we realize is that most e-commerce or most d2c brands also beyond a certain point do go to retail because retail is where you end up making more money yeah. so retail yeah. is very important even in the age of digital commerce sure and i remember very uh, well you know when i was studying in warwick i did my masters there uh, there was a great case study on apple and yeah. you know uh, i mean today i have the honor of you know being a guest lecturer at warwick and i ask this question to every you know every time i do a session there that in your opinion why did apple create uh, you know become such a large brand and yeah. everybody has different opinions but one thing that nobody like none of my sessions any student and these are global students have been able to come back with this answer because most people do not understand is when steve jobs rejoined apple in the late yeah. 90s he wanted to create that kind of a brand and if yes. that branding can only happen through retail stores yeah so during yeah. that time the person who was handling gap stores had really created great store experience you know great Correct. music playing and great artifacts being there he yeah. got that person as part of apple and since then apple stores were some of the fanciest stores in the world correct and because they were so fancy no pillars you know open tables putting each product like it's a kohinoor ka hira and that that store experience the retail experience is what made apple the kind of a brand perception that apple has it's so it's a uh, definitely is a product definitely it's yeah. other things but the retail experience made a very very imp- important role there sure sure in fact if you know apple has the highest retail sales productivity across any category across any brand although i would say that having studied apple a lot having read multiple books on uh, apple steve jobs and the whole thing uh, my conclusion it's basically it's the ecosystem that apple has created that has led to this kind of a success and the ecosystem does include retail in a very big way because retail does impact branding uh, but the whole ecosystem of the touch screen and then the app store 
and the way he created a very seamless kind of a mobile ecosystem operating system of his own which also meant that he was not dependent on any uh, anybody here as well as if you take any other mobile phone they are all dependent on the google's operating system and that's what has led to you know the kind of seamlessness that apple has created and because i've been using apple across all products right whether it's phone or ipad right now we are doing this call on a ipad or a mac uh, it's so seamless that what i do on one device automatically transfers itself onto the other device whether it's making notes or mail or anything that i do photos so it's so seamless so this whole ecosystem that he devised right from the app store to the operating system to the device itself to the multiple applications that have been created across the world i think he he was a genius without doubt and uh, right. this whole ecosystem has really helped apple to become what it is and will make it be the number one maybe in few years time also he should be there if uh, they keep on reinventing you know new products and new things that they are that outing about so i think great great ecosystem right so sir uh, you know it will be great if you can give us a quick walk through of your of your journey so let's start sure, with sure. Uh, very quickly uh, how did you end up in textiles was there any family background or was it a conscious call uh from there you know how did you graduate from your different career experience leading to being the mb sure. of shop shop and what are you sure. you know doing now sure sure so uh, i don't know why i got the bug of textile I, i really have no no single word to explain other than the fact that i loved fabrics when when i was in school or in college and i have had this taste for design and product for sure and when i passed out my 12th science and i had done both pcb and pcm i had got admission to walchand college i was in kolhapur so i had got admission to walchand college i also got admission to the medical college miraj because both i had got about 91% and uh, but i had fancied uh, textile and so i had applied to vjti i got through so i went back and cancelled my walchand admission miraj i never went to take the admission because the dates were still closer so once i took admission to textile and i joined vjti so i was a little worried about you know what's happening there and why not then pursue mba right now and then come back to textile once i completed my mba and that would also help me to go from instead of shop floor to get into the management side that was the whole idea behind pursuing mba and uh, that's how i got admission into simbasis pune and i completed my mba marketing and as luck would have it uh, mafatlal called me back to join the marketing team under uh, mr anubhai dhuldoya and uh, mr navneet mogra who were my two bosses at that point of time and uh, it was a great journey of learning so one year of uh, management training and then uh, mafatlal had started a new merchandising division to source lot of new fabrics that they were not making at that point of time like dhoti towels uh, text by text sarees blouse material viscose sarees all that product and uh, i was given in charge although i was quite young didn't know much about merchandising or sourcing uh, but i think uh, what makes a difference as i said at the beginning you know trust trust is a very very important tool for anybody and uh, both my bosses understood that they could trust me uh, as far as things are concerned of handling things if i made a mistake i could correct it and they would guide me from time to time and uh, this division started well was doing quite well and uh, then i got a bug of thinking that okay why not i join something else because i was not seeing bafatlal heading in the right direction i i thought that i needed to change direction at that point of time and johnson and johnson uh, which as you know is one of the most reputed pharma company in india uh, called me to join them as uh, manager buying and uh, initially i didn't know what manager buying was supposed to be doing but i had done some study and then understood that bandaid as you know uh, and various plasters all those products are basically textile products that are coated and that's why they required and these are large quantities of buying of fabric plaster fabric as well and uh, they wanted somebody who understood textile and who understood to source them better because they were having multiple challenges sourcing those fabrics from multiple vendors so i joined uh, johnson and johnson it is a phenomenal journey for me just one year i spent uh, but i had a fantastic boss mr sudhir fadke who taught me mbo who taught me multiple other things of how to look at sourcing etc but the best part was learning specification so as you know anything that you do in exports is 
lot of specification domestic market beer really doesn't look at specification so much today definitely people are looking at specification but not not in those days and the biggest two specifications were usp and bp so bp stands for british pharmacopeia and us usp stands for united states pharmacopeia so i had to learn exactly how the sourcing that i did followed those standards and met those standards and delivered those standards in the gray product as well as the finished product and that's where my learning came in in terms of how to look at textile where to source so that was part 1 part 2 was in many of our products we had only one single source so my challenge was to develop alternatives and i did develop alternatives for each of the products that we were sourcing and third obviously is to get the price down so that our profitability goes up and obviously the last one was get reduction of uh, you know rejections a lot of rejection was happening because either the width was not right or it was not following the spec so how to get the spec correctly followed when i get the product delivered and how to get everything right so in one year's time i i i won't uh, really give you a wrong figure the rejection came down by 60 to 70% the 60% sourcing, yes yes because there are multiple things that you have to really adjust the number of sources as i told you multiplied across every category the sourcing price i was able to renegotiate better and got it down by about 30 35% as a result our profitability of the finished product went up almost by 70 80% and you know the managements are always happy when they see these kind of results so they also gave me a charge of developing a new film for packaging for hdld film which also has able to develop uh, in about 2 months time and at a cost which was about 20 25% lower than the existing price that we were sourcing and so it was a great journey great company great standards and great working atmosphere uh, as far as gnj is concerned they also believed in something called as credo which i used later on in my career as well and uh, we used to have these credo meetings every 2 to 3 months i attended almost 3 meetings in one year's time uh, really dedicated to how the brand should be how you should treat your stakeholders including consumers suppliers etc and great integrity standard it, it was one of the best companies that i worked with and uh, then came uh, a call from arvind denim they were launching denim in india and uh, they wanted a young team to be built up under mr govind chandani and uh, i i liked uh, what they were talking about and that was the starting point for the denim revolution of india in 1987 and that's how i joined arvind denim which it was called cornerstone brand because they wanted to segregate it into a marketing company now today when you look at denim everybody thinks boss denim to bahut easy hai har koi khareedta hai har koi pehenta hai 87 we had multiple challenges people did not understand what denim is and in fact when we went to manufacturers saying aap denim khareediye and uh, when we used to tell them it is guaranteed to fade so they used to laugh at us and say how can you sell us something which is guaranteed to fade we want products that are not fading which are guaranteed not to fade and you are telling us a reverse i said the guarantee to fade is all about how it fades and how it does not affect other fabrics etc and the beauty of denim is in its fading as the color keeps on evolving over a period of time the beauty keeps on adding and to really market it well we created a concept called denim magic and denim magic would cover manufacturers process houses consumers retailers almost the entire ecosystem as you call it now we didn't know the word called ecosystem that point of time uh, but for manufacturers so for example we created gadgets so smaller manufacturers could not stitch denim because of its heavy nature so right. we got created some gadgets which they could attach on their machine and manage to do the stitching for process houses they did not know how to wash denim so we created 5 6 8 recipes in house and went and gave it to them that these are the recipes these are the chemicals these are the sources and this is the kind of look you will get and supported them with visit of our r&d teams to get the processing houses to do all kinds of washes whether it is a stone wash denimax for example what we talk about denimax today is what something we got from uh, international markets and then gave the recipe to everybody to to other garment brands basically we also gave them catalog so uh that point of time we uh, joined hands with wendel rotex and created a denim magic catalog book with styling designing pocketing everything you you name it the way any uh, design uh, catalog would be we created that and then gave it away to them with even 
patterns inside it so they did not have to do anything they just had to buy the catalog they could use the pattern copy paste it and then add on whatever they wanted in terms of wash look stitch etc etc for consumers we created denim magic pillars we did in about 20 cities right from sangli to miraj to agra etc so basically tier 2 tier 3 we got together multiple manufacturers right from a killer to smaller manufacturers as well including denim t-shirts denim bags denim school bags would display there and we would have golgappa eating competitions antakshari competition it used to be a 3 day 4 day event in the most popular hall in that particular city and really make denim popular as far as the customer is concerned because customers were also not clear about what denim is how to use it etc and so then denim magic exhibition absolutely and then denim magic exhibitions for manufacturers as well where we had display of denim printed bed sheets denim printed art uh, posters um, school bags you name it we uh, shoes caps belts everything that we could make out of denim including lightweight denims etc which also we created over a period of time we also started a product called washed denim which was actually a brushed denim and then there was also uh, the imprinted kind of a denim which was embossed so multiple kinds of products we made just to ensure that the brand and the product were marketed very well and in four years time it was like you know we were the number one denim ma- manufacturer in india denim brand in india for sure everybody knew including manufacturers to the consumers and we grew almost by 100% over that period so i joined as regional manager uh, was a marketing head uh, in the third mid th- in the third year so that continued for another year or so and then we had signed uh, a license with aro and mr govind chandani had moved into the garment or apparel division for that that point of time at that point of time we had flying machine as the only apparel brand and uh, so he wanted somebody who under, understood fabric as well as marketing to join his team and i was the first team member uh, to join aro and uh, within about 14 months aro became the number one brand and at that point of time you know i had to learn about actually making a shirt multiple kinds of things that you require in a shirt the specifications that i had learned in uh, jnj really helped me to really follow the standards that aero us had i did a short uh, stint in aero us trying to understand their philosophy product etc and at that point of time we launched the button down range in india the front placket and from that point of time i always been a button down fan with front placket box pleat you name it it's the proper shirt in my opinion and uh, we created the sub brand that they had at that point of time in us in india called dover fairfield and they were big success so and one of the biggest challenge for us was their reverse blend of fabric that they had which was 60% cotton 40% polyester nobody was really making it at that point of time so i pushed mafatlal i pushed arvind i pushed madhura and really got that made across check stripe solid uh classical oxford as which is what aero was known that point of time and pin point oxford and these were fabrics not really used by many in india and so we created a new range of fabrics new kinds of finish and look and aero became a big hit at that point of time now so aero was based in bangalore and my family i tried to move uh, wasn't really able to move because my wife was also teaching she is an electrical engineer she was teaching in a polytechnic okay. here and uh, we were not able to move that point of time so i came back to mumbai i uh, did a short stint at stanros handling shirts uh, exports and the domestic bed linen line and then bombay dyeing offered me a job in the retail division and vivaldi so vivaldi was the first break in bombay dyeing turning around vivaldi was about a year and a half two years job and then the whole rds which is as you know more than 400 stores <coughs> of bombay dyeing and uh, did quite well there but i thought again uh, so the textile scenario in india as you know over a period of time had been glowing quite bleak because no new investments was, were happening no new things were happening and uh, as a result you can see all the textile mills have really other than a raiment which is really survived very very well and uh, arvind which is doing okay but i would say the amount of new things that they try to do versus the amount of return that they have got hasn't really been matched but majority of the other textile mills in india or mumbai for example are as good as uh, zero or finished in my opinion so i thought why not jump into retail and that's how 2001 uh, when i got a call from 
shoppers to really join them as buying merchandising head uh, i i took the challenge and uh, but 2001 i didn't know what buying merchandising was honestly i had done that in uh, aero uh, but that was really you know quite quite i would say basic work that i had done at that point of time uh, handling merchandising handling sourcing handling logistics as well as marketing but this was much much bigger in fact when i joined shoppers the first day that i joined economic times had a headline a shopper stop finished 7 days later business today did a cover story a shop was stopped closing down and i was like in a shock i said what where have i landed up i was i was doing quite okay and have i landed up in a company that's now going to shut down so uh, have i moved from fire into double fire kind of a situation you know and so i went and chatted up with my boss I said what's happening you know we are uh, we are in a difficult situation we have to come out of it we will come out of it and you are you have been recruited just to ensure that we get out of this situation so one of the biggest challenge at that point of time was huge stocks that we were carrying of uh, old merchandise number 1 we are going through a whole new uh, erp system uh, stabilization and uh, we had thrown out madura quotes from the from the retail chain as from the assortment and our sales were going down average selling prices were going down so multiple challenges we had so i identified a number of uh, actions that we could take S- sat with my team my team members thought i was crazy in suggesting some of the things that i was suggesting uh, but we agreed to disagree and said okay i am suggesting 100 you are suggesting zero let's come midway and take 60 actions 70 actions that i am suggesting and uh, after about 4 weeks or so the actions that i had taken started showing results so the whole team came back strongly supported my all the actions and we had targeted to turn around the entire stock problem sales problem etc in about 20 weeks or so uh, we were able to do it in about 22 23 weeks so just about 10% more than uh, time that i had predicted and post december 20 uh, 2001 is 2001 april i had joined december 2001 i promised all my suppliers that your payments will not be late anymore from this time onwards and uh, i would say other than rare occasions during my 18 year stint maybe there could be 10 occasions in over 18 year period uh, we never had a problem i never got a call from a supplier saying mera payment kidhar hai yes he wanted a payment faster earlier which is okay which always happens you know sometimes you have to help your suppliers etc but for almost 18 years we never had a problem in payments we were able to manage things well we started a number of new initiatives which is you know uh, merchandise sor as it is called these days on uh, supply or sale or return as it is called so correct so that that was something that shopper started at that point of time we had visited a retailer in uh, Malaysia called Parksons and uh, he showed us the way and China at that point of time you know was 100% consignment model SOR or consignment as it is called so we learned a few things from there we also uh, built a lot of trust with our, all our suppliers we got Madura back into a fold in about by May 22 June 22 Madura was back in our stores and we built huge relationships with everybody so we started a new thing called uh, so everybody knows about two parameters that most of the companies run you know one is called customer satisfaction index so it's called csi second is called associate satisfaction index which is not done everywhere but it's basically employee satisfaction but partner satisfaction is a very rare thing because when you ask partners mm-hmm. to rate you it's not very easy it is exactly like facing your exams and after the results are out you have to read really read it so we started PSI partnership satisfaction index and from january 22 onwards for 18 years we ran not only PSI ASI CSI but we also had a annual partnership meet every year whether one day or one and a half day where i would read actually how they have scored me or the company and where do they rate me badly or the company badly and where do they think we should improve and i had to answer each and every of those queries in a open forum with my whole team together after reading the whole uh, question sheet answer sheet and the rating sheet and then promise them what are the next steps that we will do 
in a very open form now this is something not many companies do across the world i have not it, heard of this happening it is it is the highest level of transparency that you can get anywhere between a company and its partners so we always called our suppliers as partners because as a multi brand department store if you are selling 80% to 85% of brands you require the support all the time because you go through thick and thin times you go through good times bad times but if their support is there you can come out of it very very clearly so psi was something that is really a pioneering effort that shoppers did and uh, 18 years we ran it while i was there and uh, it's one of the biggest i would say compliment that i always get from all my partners that this is the two level of partnership that they have seen and they had no issue in calling up giving me galis and asking for answers because that's the true spirit of you know pointing out mistakes if you have made a mistake they would easily point it out and we would be more than happy to answer interact and correct it immediately because that's something that we stood for the partnership is very very important for us and these three parameters so coming back to the three parameters consumer satisfaction is what consumers rate you for but associates being satisfactory or being happy is very important because if they are not happy they will not serve the customer well and the customer will not be happy they will not interact with partners and the partners will not be happy so if you look at this this is a triangle where all three have to be happy to really make your company successful and that's very very important and i would say very very different than any other company that you really know about and not many people talk about a partnership in that kind of a sense you know which is very very important so uh, having turned around so 2001 i joined 2002 we turned around the company quite well 2005 we actually went into an ipo we became a listed company a uh, 2008 9 so i moved up from buying merchandising head to ceo to ceo by the time the ipo happened and 2008 9 i was made the president and then the managing director so 2008 9 we also went through another uh, big blockbuster problem you know we had gone into multiple other formats and the formats are not doing well and the whole global slowdown happened and that's when i took over uh, but within a year so our share price had actually been beaten very very badly it dropped down to almost like 40 and we needed funds to really expand as well so at that point of time when i took over i looked at the whole scenario as to what are the things that i have to do as md because i would be now the md of the company uh, looked at multiple options multiple triggers call the whole team together did a lot of brainstorming with them and put together action plan which was like you know a team action plan so coming back one of the big important points in retail or any other business if you ask me is it is not leadership alone it is teams that make a difference and lot of things that i say today is not i who did it it is a team which did it and team which executed it because yes i can come up with the idea one team member can come up with the idea but executing the idea well is i think the most important thing for the success of company so coming back again it was a 12 month period where our share price moved up from 40 50 to 400 rupees back we are back to profitability and we made the highest profit at that point of time in 9 10 than we had ever made so that was the second uh, i would say turn around as far as shoppers is concerned and then we we were running quite well for the next 4 5 years and that's when the omni channel bug hit us and then we started omni channel journey as well Uh, but before i stepped down in 2018 i exited three businesses one was hypercity which we had sold to future uh, we sold time zone to the time zone group and there was nuance which we sold back to the nuance group uh, which was a duty free operations and we got amazon to invest in us so from a 750 crore debt in 2018 january we were sitting on 450 crore cash when i stepped down in june 2018 and i so know it's always good to step down on a high rather than wait for things to go wrong so our retirement age was 58 and that's why i stepped down in 2018 uh, quite happy about the whole journey but as i keep on saying you know it's like k3g kabhi khushi kabhi gham it's always ups and downs uh, and you have to keep on reinventing like what amitabh bachchan has done or like even mahendra singh dhoni has done so if you look at the careers of the best of the people whether it's in movies or i would say even sports it is all about reinventing yourself and 
companies have to keep on reinventing themselves people have to keep on reinventing themselves add on to the abilities add on to the competencies keep on learning and i think that's the most important part of your journey that you must enjoy the journey whether it's good bad ugly i think those things keep on happening there is nothing to stop you from that uh, but i think passionately keeping on learning i think is that's something that i believe very very strong here i am so amazed because it's such a fascinating journey you've had there were multiple times when i was fascinated when you said you know i joined johnson and johnson or shopper stop not knowing what that role is not knowing what that you know what i'm supposed to do and still having done so much and um, uh, extremely fascinating uh, you know since since you've spoken about your time your you know uh, from late 70s till now in textiles yeah something interesting i would want you to share with us and the listeners also is yeah. what is your take on the evolution of indian textile industry you know in these last 30 40 years i'm sure a lot has changed you know especially you being from mumbai you know uh, bombay mein jitna meat ka culture tha jo aaj nahi hai and then slightly expanding ahead outside of bombay to bhiwandi kolapur yeah, yeah, that yeah. how is yeah. that journey been No, so i think it's if you ask me it's quite a sad journey because i've seen uh, textiles at their peak i have seen them now at their nadir because uh, many of the textile mills that i was associated with and i have seen very very closely have almost shut down in mumbai and uh, there are no more the workers the mills the spindles the looms etc and there are multiple reasons for that so some of them had started outsourcing their own manufacturing either to bhiwandi chalkarji surat etc that also led to their own fall because they did not develop new technologies to keep upgraded managements obviously had their own issues in terms of either family challenges or family partitions or family divisions that happened or able managers not joining textile so one of the biggest problems if you ask me in textile is not many people not many capable uh, people join textile in the management side i think that's a more worst part that i've seen third obviously is the way the government policies of india versus chinese government policy has evolved so one of the big factors for china's growth across global economy and export is all about textile and apparel second category would be plastics and then obviously over a period of time technology and other things have happened but why did china choose textile and apparel as the big category for growth is the kind of population that they had so if you look at the huge population that they had how do we give them more work if you have lot of cotton production why not get into spinning why not get into multiple other fibers and then get into you know apparel and become the exporter to the world that's what china really did through their policy for a 20 30 year period now india's apparel policy forget apparel policy india doesn't have i would say a full fledged ecosystem textile policy and when i say ecosystem textile policy what is it so you have the yarn lobby you have the cotton textile lobby you have the cotton unorganized textile lobby you have the synthetic manufacturers lobby you have apparel exporters lobby you have retailers only organized retailers lobby and you have the unorganized retailers lobby so each of these lobbies is actually asking for different things obviously which is only for their own good and as a result the government doesn't have a real full fledged policy for the textile industry and the apparel industry as such in spite of having one of the largest base of people to work one of the largest base of raw material which is cotton one of the largest base of making polyester and other products and obviously machinery that can be done for apparel and look at it even bangladesh is ahead of us in apparel exports what does it mean such a small size country but going really leaps and bounds yes they have got all the support from china manufacturers quotas etc etc leave that apart we on indian apparel manufacturers are manufacturing out of bangladesh but i think the sad part is we don't have what i call as a ecosystem policy for the entire industry and that is where we have struggled unlike china which has had this kind of a policy and at one point of time we had some of the best fabrics being made some of the best garments being made uh, today i think we are we are there yes there are some big manufacturers in india but really speaking nothing really big as compared to china i think we we lost the race some time ago 
maybe we can catch up back again if the policies are right if everybody sits together and gets it right but i think the golden age of indian textile is out and over in it is after the textile strike i think we haven't been able to recover at all so if you were to give a time lapse or uh, you know very quickly a quick time lapse on the the you know the evolution of textile industry how would yeah. that be so if you look at really speaking during the british period so let's say 1890s to 1920s they wanted uh, basically to utilize the cotton and they wanted also to utilize a lot of manufacturing in india that's when a lot of textile mills in, came up in india 1920s to 1930s is the base of i would say textile mills that came up and then obviously swadeshi post the uh, independence between 47 to again right up to 60 70s you can still see a lot of manufacturing happening apparel was still very very slow in india i think it started only after 1970s or so uh, but i would say till 80s was the golden period after that we haven't really seen a great time and even some of the biggest exporters like uh, hindujas for example which is gokul das exports etc uh, took a back seat in the 2000s and 2010 while till 20 i would say 2000 2005 they were really going great guns with big capacities etc but i think there are there are challenges in labor policies as well as the overall ecosystem policies which is really hampering the growth of uh, our industry so sir uh, especially from your uh, shopper shop experience uh, yeah. how important do you think is market research and especially for textile promoters or textile management how do you kind yeah. of balance out data driven insights to you know intuition or experience in decision making no well, i think data is extremely important and uh, frankly doing consumer research as i said we were doing customer satisfaction indices every year but we also had separate research on customers about fashionability products brands that they liked etc which was a running track and any store that we opened in a new territory we would do a dipstick study of research as well so research is very very important analytics is extremely important because as you know shopper shop has one of the largest loyalty programs in the country today maybe 8 and 1/2 million members Uh, and when i joined we were just about 2 lakh members so you can see the journey how how loyalty program has evolved and 85 to 90% of the sale comes out of the loyalty members it's that strong and to run analytics on these customers is very very important to understand what are they buying what new category can they buy what new occasions and can they buy and how can you get them back into the store so if you have a customer who is buying two times how can you get him to come and buy three times if somebody is buying five times how can you get him to buy eight times because that's how the spend keeps on increasing on your store and that's where you create you know tiers in your loyalty program whether it is classic silver gold or a co branded card with city bank now with access and then a black card which is a paid for card and shoppers is the only company which has a loyalty card which is paid for other companies they give it away free and uh, our basic criteria was when you give anything free to any customer they don't really you know think about it at all they don't really they don't care evaluate. for it they don't value it at all anything free in india okay it, and everybody gives so many things free so they don't value it so when they pay whether it's 400 rupees which is not really great but that 400 rupees they want to extract back and that's why they were harder to really get more things out of the loyalty program than we would work although yes we had specific tools arrangements to make them happy for sure things which for example they cannot buy so meeting a film star they cannot really buy so meeting a dipika during om shanti om launch or uh, seeing the whole film stars doing a sort of ramp walk during om shanti om again wasn't really easy but our gold members had it uh, attending music concerts or attending other uh, shows as free without paying any ticket but also getting front seats is again something is a privilege so giving a lot of privileges is very important and that's how the top end of the members of loyalty program are always being more pampered than anybody else and others obviously get points previews of sale etc etc so i think there were multiple actions that we really took to ensure that the loyalty program stood out but coming back analytics is the backbone of running a loyalty program 
analytics is important when you are choosing a new location you need to understand the market you need to understand through research what makes a area tick what makes a store tick and really work on it yes intuition is also very important because trends is something you can't really make only out of market research colors that come out in fashion yes there would be a wgsn forecast other forecasts but india works differently so what fashion will click what trends will click are again some things are intuition back so you have to again come back to the same formula that i talked about you know it's art science and maths it is not about only maths which is research it is not only only about science of tracking things around there is art involved as well so retail is all about all the three things and we strongly believed in market research all the time looked at multiple parameters whether it's economic parameters consumer parameters state parameters or fashion parameters and then really uh, took a stand on what we really wanted to do and shopper stop at some point also graduated to private label right you had a great brand great product at a great price point so how important was data for the uh, in house brand in terms of deciding the product line the price point the colors so if you look at it uh, shopper stop is a house of brands and the house of brands define the price point so when you talk about louis philip van usen aero there is a certain price point that they define and all their products will always be above that same thing if you take a denim line so levi's lee wrangler pepe are the key brands so killer are the key brands and they define a price point so if you look at shirts at a point of time 1200 rupees to 1400 rupees is the starting price point denims now today i think start at almost 2500 and above and go higher and higher uh, same thing if you look at t-shirt branded t-shirt round necks would be let's say 550 and above and uh, polos would be 850 to 1200 kind of a number now the challenge that we had was we needed to fill in certain gaps below those price points not very cheap but below those price point that was one second was if you look at certain categories there are no national brands so when we launch stop women's wear there are no national brands in women's ethnic wear women's western wear so biba became a national brand over a period of time w became a national brand over a period of time but when we launch stop uh, or kashish there were no national brands per se so we needed a brand to really ensure that there was great quality great product great design and accessible pricing as well that's how the private label came about and while i was there private label used to be about 12% of our share and that's where it has remained because if you try and create more private label then you are becoming you are not a department store of brands you are you are going to become a private label chain like and there's nothing wrong in becoming a private label chain but there are enough private label chains in india and uh, if you want to really be like that then you have to change the whole dynamics from what you are and you are known or you are trusted and customers come back to you because you offer a assortment of brands and that's why they come back to you so you have to be true to what your promise is all about and that's why private label can maybe maximum go to 20 22% not beyond that in my opinion actually my next question was going to be that that uh, yeah. you know once you are a department store where people are coming in for a house of brands Yes. How do you then balance out your own private label with the other suppliers? And I think Correct. you've already answered that beautifully. Correct. Correct. Right. And also, Shopper Stop at some point uh, started trying, and then you know, established a POS format, right? Point of sale where you had a lot of brands having their own point shop of sale. Shop and shop. Shop and shop. Shop and shop. Yes. So how did that happen? What was the success like? No, so uh, as I was telling you, two thousand one when I joined, we were going through a rough patch, and we were looking at a turnaround, and we were looking at multiple ideas for how to really make the turnaround happen. Two thousand, so two thousand uh, one to two, we were looking at multiple ideas, and one of the ideas that I told you was all about, you know, consignment stock, SOR stock, etc. And the second idea was creating shop in shop looks. So we were we looked at multiple ideas of how to really strengthen the assortment on one side. strengthen the whole experience uh, for the customer and really make brands more uh, responsible for the merchandise that was in our store so a lot of people think that sor or consignment is giving away space we never believed that so whenever there is sor or consignment we were equally responsible for selecting the merchandise that was in our store number 1 we are equally responsible for ensuring that the merchandise sold faster than what was available and replenishment was done jointly so that the brand 
was responsible for replenishment, but the data was sitting with us. So one of the pioneering things that happened in shoppers in 2001-2 was we created a portal on which every brand could access their daily sales data. And as things evolved, they were able to see sales data, they were able to see stock data, sale through everything at each store level on a daily basis. Now, what it really means is, you know, one of the biggest things is in retail or any other company is data is power. Now, we did not want the power to remain only with us because, you know, a lot of times data's power is misused by the merchandiser. So we wanted to ensure that the brand also had the same power. So that by the time the merchandiser came back in the morning and logged in and saw the data, the brand could also see the same data at the same point. So they could actually communicate with each other better. They were on the same wavelength. And on a weekly basis, they would get, you know, the weekly analysis of the data, sent it out to them on a Monday afternoon to evening. So they had analysis as well. So Tuesdays and Wednesdays were actually spent conversing with each other as to what action should we take at a store level, category level, product level, price point level, et cetera, et cetera. So data became non-negotiable. You know, data was not, no more power. Data was an enabler. So that was point one. And once data becomes an enabler, you can create shopping shop, you can create consignment, you can create SOR because there is nothing hidden. Both the parties know each other well. And one of the biggest bets that point of time that I was trying to take was with shopping shops and to get a few brands to create shopping shops with us. So the Levi's, the Pepe's did create Indian terrain, Jilly, for example, all the perfume brands they did create. But one of the biggest success stories at that point of time was Provoke. Provoke was a new brand at that point of time and wanted to really make an impact. And uh, there was Mr. Chaturvedi there, Nikhil Chaturvedi, who I hit off quite well. And uh, he said, look, I want so much space. I can guarantee you so much of sale. And why don't we try it? So he wanted all the stores that we had that point of time by um, eight stores by December of uh, 2001 that we had. And there were another five or six in the pipeline the next year. So he said, give me all the 15. So, so I said, Nikhil, I'm happy to experiment and I don't want to burden you 100%. But let's take five stores, make it success and then keep on adding. And the number that you're telling me, okay, let's agree that okay, even if you hit 80%, I'm okay with it. And we started the experiment. He actually hit 120% and he went on to become almost a 20, 25 crore brand in about two years time within the chain. It, it was a phenomenal success. And as others saw that success, everybody then joined in. And then one by one, each of the brands. So the entire look changed to a shopping shop across multiple categories, whether it's menswear, casual wear, denim wear, women's ethnic, women's Western. So over a three-year period, the whole look changed as far as shoppers is concerned. And that kept on evolving as we added new brands. For example, we tied up with ST Lauder, launched MAC, one of the best makeup brands in India. We launched in 2005-06, we launched Tommy Figure, Calvin Klein. We also experimented with the Build-A-Bear workshop. And so we kept on trying experimenting, adding brands, but created the whole shopping shop look where you will feel that when you come into the, our store, you're actually shopping inside this brand store rather than a department store. And the big advantage in a department store is unlike uh, a branded store. So if you go into a Levi store, like two products, but you can't compare a Pepe product or a Lee product there. But you walk into shop a stock, you shortlist that product, carry it to the Lee counter, carry it to the Pepe counter, compare it, try it, and then pick up the best that you think is right. Otherwise, you have to do it from shop to shop, which is not very easy for anybody. That you come out of Levi's, get into Lee, get out of Lee, get into Pepe, not very easy. In a department store, that's the best part for a consumer. So consumer choice is very, very important in a department store. Ease of picking the assortment, ease of trying it out, and then picking what is best suited for you is, I think, that's what department stores do. So the whole shopping shop experiment that started off with Provo uh, is, is the benchmark today across. And I think everyone has copied shoppers in that respect, every other competitor. And I would say that really certifies, you know, whatever experiment was, was absolutely right. And uh, that's what it is even now.
Yeah, I think from a customer experience point of view, that is a great one because I remember yes. when I was growing up as a kid, I was still in school, and around 2005-2006, in Orbit was had just started in Malaga. Yeah. Shopper Stop was a big place there, and Correct. I mean, for many years we would have gone only to Shopper Stop to buy our you know fashion requirements. Correct. Correct. And it had that option, and like you said, you can walk into a shopping shop inside Shopper Stop, try yes. to compare with another brand, and you know, great customer experience. Correct. Correct. Before we go there, one thing I would like to ask you: so, what are you doing right now in your capacity? What are the different engagements that you have? So one of the things that uh, you know a lot of people talk about is uh, how does a full time working executive sit back and do something which is not full time? So I think it, it's a big challenge that uh, because retail you know is twenty four seven three sixty five. Retail doesn't shut shop at all. It is always open, and um, knowing retail, there are always some things or the other happening right some things or the other that are not happening right and as the md of the company across multiple formats you have to be always on the ball that you need to be ready to answer multiple things whether it is a fire a police case something they are not you cannot predict really the right life in retail and you have to be ready so after i would say a grueling 18 years Uh, when i decided to step down i had decided that one thing that i don't want to work 365 days and 8 hours every day that is very very clear so i looked at you know what are the opportunities of not working full time and uh, having chatted with a few people few old colleagues few senior colleagues from the industry and other well wishers i realized that okay there are two or three things that i can do very easily one is obviously supporting startups Uh, which can be pro bono non pro bono it doesn't matter but it keeps you engaged it keeps you engaged in new things that are happening and you can utilize your knowledge uh, to help somebody who is starting in their own business so that is part one that i'm still doing uh, part two is uh, going on the board of few companies where you align with the board with the company and their promoters and think that okay you can again add value there, there. so that's what i also do and uh, that also includes educational institutes as well where, which is what i also do so i'm on the board of five companies i'm on the board of two governing boards of two educational institutes and i also work with uh, private equity companies so till date so right now i work with two private equity companies but in the past i worked with uh, three other private equity companies as well so private equity is all about uh, you know evaluating opportunities uh, for them to invest in and really take it on from there and uh, so these are the three verticals that i currently am busy in so private two private equity company that i work with is one is multiple second is uh, sos these are the two companies i work and sos is invested in one of the brands called xyx uh, i have met a few folks yeah. from sos delhi yeah correct correct they are delhi based uh, i and, think they uh, they got one of the best portfolios in the d2c segment absolutely so they are they are quite good quite strong and uh, so they invested in uh, xy access yogesh kabra is a ceo i am a yes. mentor to yogesh and doing quite well and growing quite well and uh, multiples is a large fund so 3 billion uh, yes. raised till now as of now almost a billion under uh, divestment or investment as you call it and done very well across uh, some of the biggest companies in india so again quite quite a large uh, project sometimes we work there and the companies uh, that i'm on board of one is called vmart from delhi uh, one of the largest uh, store chain in the department store category but tier 2 tier 3 yeah. value retail as you call it value fashion retail uh, second is called brand concept uh, which is uh, the licensee for tommy hilfiger luggage uh, third is uh, called donier shooting uh, one of one of the old shooting company and, and survived survived well and they also gone into men's apparel uh, brand as well uh, fourth is called sweet dreams limited sdl as it is called and last is called irhpl which is into airport retail so the way i have chosen companies is also the fact that they have to be different there is no conflict of interest anywhere be- within those companies and there is a different size of the company and potential of the company uh, that's how i looked at it and i'm on the bo- governing board of symbiosis two in universities one is called one is based in indore one is based in pune which are both professional universities and then from time to time 
people call me for giving lectures presentation across companies industry wide bodies uh, as well as associations and then uh, companies like ey etc also take my help for evaluating things or red seer for that matter evaluating things or working on assignments etc so i do quite i would say diverse work uh, but i do it as per my time and uh, my availability and as i said i don't want to work 24/7 i've done it, it actually uh, sounds like i've like done a lot are, uh, a day uh, engagement no no, no. so board board work is generally you know quarterly work plus maybe some work in between and right. uh, depending upon what they want from me which uh, i am more than happy to really help out on anything additional that is required uh, but this is this is what i do is quite quite i would say a wide uh, canvas to really yes. paint and uh, use all the art science and math that i talked about what more fun working with a startup like xxx or working with a legacy uh, business like say on your no i think both have different challenges so i think till the time the promoters are open to ideas promoters are open to change there's no difference per se if you ask me but yes uh, startups are much more flexible much more nimble because they have no baggage uh, what happens in a legacy company is many a times something that they have done in the past they know they have done something in the past so when you say something okay i have done this two years back when you say another alternative they we had done this 5 years back but what happens is what you did 2 years back or 5 years back the momentum could be different the timing is important in my opinion the market could be different so you have to still try in my opinion so i think there are there are different things that happen between i would say small size companies to big size companies uh, but as i said if the managements are open you know, it, it is always a fun there is no challenge there sure also sir you know since you've had such a large career you know spanning across so many different textile companies including the likes of johnson and johnson and shop stock yeah uh, yeah what are some of the personal values or principles that have guided you throughout your career sure so one of the biggest learning that i've had you know is uh, love your job and not your chair and the biggest problem that i've seen across companies across institutions is all about people fall in love with their chair with the chair could be the title could be the power that they have and then they are all the time focusing on retaining that chair the problem with this is you don't learn anything new you are a fossil stuck to a chair now my evolution if you ask me is never fall in love with your chair fall in love with your job whatever job you are doing whether you are assistant manager you are a manager you are a gm you are a vp it is not about the title it is about the role that you are doing and what do you deliver to the organization that's very important whether i am a director independent director md doesn't matter i think you have to deliver and to deliver that you have to keep on changing and you have to keep on changing means you have to keep on learning and when you look at the changes that i have seen over the last 38 years from textiles being sold in physical stores to ebos to multi brand big stores whether it's like nallis and kumaran etc to online and to personalized servicing now it it's a very very different thing that's really happened so and as things keep on evolving i think you have to keep on evolving and that's where i always tell everyone that love your job but not your chair i think that's part one of uh, my entire philosophy second part i always tell people you know is all about what i said is about teams it is never about yourself i think you have to ensure that you should care for people you should grow your people you should groom your people you should mentor your people and take them to the next level so if you can get somebody to replace you you can move to the next step so a lot of people think and i have seen it in a live action where bosses are always looking at your chair which i find very surprising so it actually shows you know that they are so 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 much you know concerned about their own power that they are always looking at replacing the number 2s and number 3s all the time whereas i always look at how can i move the number 3 to number 2 number 2 to number 1 so i can move up or i can move out whatever the model is but i think grooming your team members ensuring trust and building that team i think is very very important and obviously there are multiple other things you know which you know some of the things is all about 
how to really make a difference and to make a difference i think i always believe that what steve jobs said is very very true stay hungry stay foolish and while you have to stay hungry stay foolish keep on changing you must make a difference in everybody's life whether it's their personal life or their professional life two kind words don't hurt anybody and treating people at the same level whether he is your assistant or whether he is your boss there is no differential treatment that you should give you should treat everybody in the same way same respect and i think that's most important you know and that's what will make a difference and try and make uh, an impact on the company on the team members and one of the best things in my life i would say is uh, the whole hearted love that i get from my ex team members is something that i always cherish so i may not have millions of dollars of properties etc but i would say i have millions of dollars of worth love uh, across the country which is very important sure and i think you know with with your journey of having graduated from like so many stages to finding an md at shop stop it wouldn't have happened if you didn't have great people skill so that's commendable sir also since we talking about shop stop uh, what yeah. some of the strategies you implemented at shop stop to kind of differentiate that brand and create a memorable in store experience especially in the age of e-commerce so you know pre e-commerce sure. e-commerce so i think we covered a few of them but i just to repeat uh, one of the things uh, as i said was the three tracks that we created which is the partnership satisfaction index associate satisfaction index and customer satisfaction index i think that was one of the best uh, i would say impactful journey second uh, 2008 uh, onwards we were looking at you know how to really create a new design new experience etc so you you might have seen that we have changed our logo in 2008 so our logo used to be earlier inside a circle like a stamp it it moved to a much more modern writing oh. so when we launched that modern writing we did a 360 degree change inside the store new looks we had to interact with architects to design our new stores got much better brands into our stores etc but at the same time we were looking at you know one thing that how do i get my ethos uh, across all associates across india to really have the same service servicing the customer ability basically and uh, as i was uh, telling you earlier that in johnson and johnson i had read about this credo and uh, i had learned about it i had memorized it number of times i thought why not get into a credo kind of a thing in shoppers and then suddenly we realized that okay in shoppers if you look at it any retail store uh, 90% of the people are in the front end servicing the customer now putting together something like a credo which is one para may not work with them uh so somebody suggested why don't we create a an anthem and uh, so okay so that's a great idea so how do we create an anthem who will write it who will sing it who will compose it uh, with the key thing so between the team when we discussed we said okay gulzar ji is the best guy to really create an anthem so we went to him and uh, he said i've never re- written an anthem for a company but uh, tell me something more about you tell me something more about your company and we told him Uh, this is what it is this is a company this is what we believe in and so what is the sole objective of this anthem so i said this whole there are three objectives behind it one is to get everybody together on the same platform whether it is the management or the back end to the front end we want everybody to be together thinking only of customer number one number two their thinking should be how do i service the customer better than what i can and how can i make him the best service basically and third is really be happy about the service and not gloating about the service so he said fantastic i understood this let me let me think through and he said while you are chatting i i remember a poem from my past and i know what to really do so he created the anthem for us had uh, se aage it's called had se aage and uh, if you want i can play it uh, for the listeners or i can send it to you and you can play it sometime but yeah, it's a phenomenal it written played as part of the podcast whenever sure it's it's a phenomenal anthem and uh, so he created that so then we asked him look whom do you suggest uh, to sing this and to compose so he suggested the composer you know the uh, music director of khaki uh he suggested him so he called him for a audition we went through and then we discussed who should sing it so sonu nigam kk because that's the kind of genre it is so both agreed that no this is sonu nigam and it has to be sonu nigam and the part is when sonu nigam came in heard the song he sang the song 
and then he liked it so much that uh, he said look after the song was complete he felt that i want to add an antara here i think it will add volumes to your sound to the whole impact that you are really thinking about and we said why not let's try it so he recorded that antara that he added or his own which was not part of either the written uh, song nor of the music and it's come out so beautiful but the next part was how do you use it so then we discuss okay do we want to use it only on occasions or do you want to use it every day how do you do it so finally all of us agreed that okay the stores open at 11 o'clock why not play it at 10:45 every day across all stores offices warehouse and uh, so 2008 to 2023 now it's 15 years every day it is played at 10:45 before the store opens across the company across stores warehouses and it really wow. takes you to the next high of i would say inspiration motivation being together being one team whether you are in mumbai or delhi or chennai or calcutta or guwahati it doesn't matter whether you are in the warehouse you are in the back end you are in the front end you are a buyer you are a, a department manager doesn't matter all of you are singing together yes some of us may not be able to sing but you are at least there thinking about that song and praying along with all others so it's like a prayer and that's something i think it made a huge huge difference to the whole motivation of the team and i'll i'll, I'll send it to you uh, do do play it uh, so for you guys listening to the story i'm getting goosebumps because like, it is it is team high it would kind of have it is it is it is one of the best things that ever happened in i would say my entire career of the way i look at it of the initiatives that were really executed well and uh, how things have really changed post that and how people really look at it very very differently so anthem i think was was a great great difference the way we changed the logo for example and the way the stores made an impact the way we bought shopping shops the way we raised the whole loyalty program to the next level definitely was a was a big thing for sure and uh, multiple things that we did on the way launch new brands that were never there for example us polo today is one of the biggest brands in india but it was launched first as shopping shop and shop stop uh, jilly was nowhere a brand Ginny and Journey was no nowhere a brand. Biba became a brand in Shoppers Shop. So a lot of brands we supported by launching them in Shoppers as shopping shop, and then they are really taken off or reached the next level for sure. Uh, we tried multiple experiments as well in technology. For example, Magic Mirror. I think we tried seven years back, and I don't know whether you have seen it. Uh, I don't think it is existing anymore. But you stand in front of it and you swipe your hands, your shirt. that you want will get changed the trousers that you want will get changed you can try various looks on yourself and that was something that we tried long time ago and the enter omni channel journey as well although today i would say that omni journey across uh, multiple retailers hasn't really been very successful in india and the prime reason is the entire online in india the whole ecosystem of online in india is foreign known so if you look at it the mobile phones are international the ipads are international the macs are international the operating systems are international the marketplaces are international the social media is international so none of the things that really support your ecosystem of online shopping is indian it is all international including even the payment systems so the whole challenge for indian online has been cost of acquisition which is which continues to be very very high and till the time it continues to be very high all online players will have to ensure that they get into physical retail today or tomorrow to start making money and actually grow and expand the retail vision so this is a challenge that indian online does have and hopefully over the next 3 4 years time maybe it will get easier for others to really go through but omni hasn't been a great journey for indian retailers for sure i think sir if i were to summarize your career uh, i would rather say it's a great combination of creativity conceptualization and execution because sure. so many things you said have completely blown me away so really really appreciate you sharing so much of insights you know thank you time i'm really sorry it kind of got extended so much no no issue no issue uh, before we conclude a very quick fun rapid fire segment sir we'll sure sure in quick uh, <laughs> if sure. there could be one fashion trend you would want to come back right which what what would that be uh, to come back you are saying yes uh, i i, I, I 
Yeah, I would say the the way I love button down shirts, for example, I think they are the most graceful product, and not many people understand it. And I would love to see that uh, trend to come back in a bigger way. Okay. Not one percent or two percent of shirts, but maybe ten percent of shirts. I don't know. Some somewhere I thought maybe you will say bell bottoms because you know most people. No bell bottoms. So when you look at today's generation, which is you know much more fit. Uh, right. bell bottoms really don't sit in that uh, kind of genre you know so because mm. bell bottoms is like that whole hippy look kind of a situation uh-huh. uh, which yeah. i think good in the past not not today sure. for sure and if you could choose just one color which you know the entire fashion segment will will kind of have which color would that be so blue is the most dominant color because i think denim was blue for me and blue is something i always loved and during the denim days we used to jokingly always say for all our team members you know that if they pierce our blood only denim blue will come out that's that's the kind of blue that we had at that point of time so blue is my favorite color for sure okay and last question sir if you could create a new fashion category or a new clothing item what would you create and if you could then what would you name it so i think one of the biggest items in menswear which is not really been addressed very well is i would say traveler's pants so a lot of international brands have created traveler's pants but they are too expensive 150 dollars 130 dollar kind of a price you know so i would say that somebody who can create a 2000 to 3000 rupee traveler pant which is smart light easy to use easy to wash can really make huge huge numbers in india it, it could even be lower priced at that maybe 1500 to 2500 but men would really thank somebody who can create a great travel span nice thank you so much sir i mean, really appreciate this and I've, i've had a lot of fun uh, interacting sure with you. sure I hope sure you sure your time as well same same here same here great and i'll send you uh, the anthem uh, which uh, you can if you want you can play it after you hear it if you think it is worthwhile and uh, for sure thanks great thank okay thank you so much time where where Bye. are you based mumbai we were in mumbai mahim i am in mahim okay okay i hope next time i am in mumbai i get to meet you would love to sure sure you. sure sure, sure. we'll catch up right. we'll catch up all right thank you so much sir thank you care. see you bye
किसी बात पे गौर करो